and uh, Shalom, uh, Shalom Bai, uh, what, what they want, uh, what do you think that actual deal will look like in practice in terms of getting ultra-Orthodox to civil service or the military? Well, I mean, the, the, the devil is indeed in the detail here, and I don't know. We know that um, Yeshatid's platform, which, like I, like I say, reflects a gentler approach, but the idea was that over a five-year transition period, you get to the stage where you're limiting the number of exemptions to, I think that their ultimate thing was, was to 400. There'd only be 400 best and the brightest scholars each year who were exempted from the military. Well, that's, you know, that's unthinkable for, I would say, both ultra-Orthodox parties. The question is, and, and I'm sure Jonathan's right, about maybe Shas are a little less unwooable than UTJ, than, than United Torah Judaism, and, and what would it take that, that would enable some kind of compromise that has them working with you rather than working against you? Their desire would be to probably to, um, to, to, to ha have a sort of a, a different approach where instead of a cap on the number of exemptions, you know, it worked the other way around. But, you know, there was a proposal set up by a, um, a key aide to Netanyahu, um, which, which would have essentially taken about 60% of each year's eligible ultra-Orthodox. That was, that's been rejected by everybody, which maybe is a good sign. Okay? So maybe it's something along those lines that everybody said was unacceptable, so that maybe you know, the power of necessity will mean it. But, but you know, it will depend. If, Sh if they're still trying to bring Shas in, then, and, they think, and, and Netanyahu thinks he can get Shas and, say, Jewish Home, or both of the other parties, the contours of the agreement might be different. And I would just add one, you know, one, one sort of, uh, I don't know if you, do, do Americans say spanner in the works? That's like words you don't know what I'm talking about, right? right. A wrench. A wrench in, sure. the, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the, in the what? In the what? Sand in the gears. Sand sure. in the gears. Okay, there you go. I've been married to an American for like a long, long time, but I haven't quite learned your language yet. Anyway, one of the complications is that they'll, you know, there's, there's the capacity to appeal everything to the Supreme Court and so on. The Tal law was, you know, processes to, to, to render the Tal law, um, unacceptable legally began a decade ago. Right? It was only last year the Supreme Court struck it down. And therefore, you know, the, the advantages of doing things by consensus are obvious. I would add to that the kind of imperative to do things by consensus. You know, we have lots of challenges that we haven't discussed in this forum you know, that are external, that we can't fix by ourselves or that we can't fix solely by ourselves. There is one that we should be able to solve with a little bit of sensitivity and a bit of common sense and goodwill and national interests and, and much better to do it by consensus rather than you know, imposing and then running you know, immense legal battles and it all drags on and so on. That's what I hope will happen. I think there's, a, there's an important dimension to add to this and that is that it's not simply about drafting the ultra-Orthodox. Actually, the army wouldn't know what to do with all the ultra-Orthodox. It, it, it doesn't really need masses of more manpower. It's important that the ultra-Orthodox are drafted because otherwise uh, everyone else feels what you say in Hebrew is a, they're a friar. Right? Yeah. Which means they're like, why are, they, why are we the ones getting shot? Why are we the ones taking the risk? That's why it's important, because Israeli society's cohesiveness depends on the idea that we all are, share the burden and, and all of that. It's not because the army actually needs these people. It's, it would be expensive to use them all. That being the case, the other side is what the Israeli economy and society needs is the ultra orthodox to go out to work. Okay. Right now, you can have an exemption uh, if you've, you know, if you're in studying Torah, if you're studying until you're 30, 31, or 32, or, or when you've, and then if you get six children, then you don't have to do it. Full stop. So what the what the economists want in Israel is to lower that to 23, 24, and to get the ultra the orthodox in the workforce. And the problem with the the proposal put forward by the Likud was I don't think so much the 60 percent. I think 60% would be, the army would be fine with it. I think, you know, it's a majority. Society can live with it, right, at least for now. The problem is it only said that ultra-Orthodox students in yeshiva, of whom there are tens of thousands, right, that their stipends that they get from the state would drop by 200 shekel, what's that, $50, right? That, that is not going to make, it's not going to resolve Israel's economic crisis. And the reason that Bennett and Yeshatid uh, are being so firm about this is they, they don't want the ultra-Orthodox to have the housing ministry and the interior ministry and chairmanship of the committee that deals with finances in the Knesset because they don't want them to be able to open the tap round the back, right? So once they've got an agreement, right, I think they'll be, they know they can't draft only, you know, everyone except 400 ultra-Orthodox students by force. It's, it's just inconceivable. It's not possible without 
serious violence and, and internal mayhem. But that's not the issue. The, the issue here is saving, uh, in the long term, a restructuring the economy and the society. Thank you. Back. Yeah, Julio Rosenstein from Dallas. Just to follow up on the ministries, assuming that um, Netanyahu is able to put together a, a coalition, which I doubt it, and we have that discussion before. But assuming that he's able to do that, there are two key ministries. One is defense. And is there a chance that Barack is going to change his mind? And if he's not going to change his mind, who are the potential candidates? And the second is uh, a foreign ministry, that uh, Barack did a great job. Lieberman probably did a lousy job in terms of PR and dip diplomacy. Is there a going to change that Lieb Lieberman will be history? OK, I mean, there's a couple of things I want to say. First of all, you, you came to the panel before, and therefore you're like heroic in my eyes. Because yeah. you've now, you've now heard us like twice. I like very much. If I get a 10% discount, I may join that means you. you have to, that means you have to pay and double the amount of money. Yeah. Um, the second thing is I'd like to apologize on behalf of Jonathan and myself that we're talking. You've got a couple of ex-Brits here talking to Americans about Israel. I don't know how, that, how the hell that happened. But the third thing I want to say, which we should take for granted, but I want to stress it anyway, and it's, it's the framework of what we're talking about. We had elections in Israel in a region that is collapsing around our ears into anarchy and who knows what. And it was the most you know, smooth, honest, decent, untroubled, clean, uncorrupt process. And it's an amazing thing. There was, there was one case where we thought it was election fraud. Oh, fantastic. In this Druze village, 109 people voted for Otsmali Israel, which was the most right-wing political party which failed to get into the Knesset. What were 109 Druze doing voting for Otsmali Israel? So the judge in charge, he sends it to the court to investigate. You know, it was a clerical error. Yeah. In, in, fact, in fact, two people in that village voted for and I don't know who those two people were either, but you, you get the idea. So just bear that it's an amazing thing. We, we have, we, you know, One-fifth of our country is not Jewish. It's a crazy region. We speak about Israel as a democracy. That election was an amazing and wonderful thing. You know, everybody, are we going to hand over power and is it going to be tra is the transition going to be orderly? Of course it is. We don't even think about those things in Israel, but it's worth highlighting. On your two specific points, I'm sure Barack would love to carry on as defense minister. As I said before, he is, I'm sure, convinced that the well-being of Israel is immensely Im improved by his presence in that position. But I don't think that, that, that you know, again, I could be wrong. I'd, I'd be really wrong on this one, because I, I think there's no chance whatsoever that he will carry on as defense minister. Uh, he has no political um, weight to add in, in, a, in a combination of uh, of complexity where giving away a key ministry to someone who you don't have to give it to, it's just unthinkable. Um, there, are, there are candidates, you know, there's a former chief of staff who's very senior in the Likud, Moshe Yalon, um, who's, who's fairly reliably supportive of Netanyahu as well, which is a fairly critical um, uh, consideration for the prime minister. On the foreign ministry, you know, Lieberman says that Netanyahu is holding the job open for him. That's terrible. Uh, I don't know. Um, if Lapid is a key coalition player, is there another job? Would he take the finance ministry, which is just, just a bad job for anyone? You know, if you, if you do well, it's the prime minister who gets the credit. If you do badly, everyone blames the finance minister. So is he going to take the defense ministry? I don't think there's, I think he's a smart, I think he's significantly smarter uh, uh, than would be necessary um, to, to realize. <laughs> Well, Amir Peretz took the defense ministry in 2006. By the way, you know, if I'm roaming here anyway, one of the most popular politicians in Israel for a while, belatedly and unexpectedly, because it was Amir Peretz, didn't do terribly well on the Lebanon war, did push through Iron Dome, you know, which we wouldn't have had if it wasn't for a defense minister who said, you know, I come from Sterot and we'd really like something to stop, you know, rockets falling on our houses. So if it, it, you know, is it going to be Lieberman or, or what other senior job is there for Lapid if he doesn't get the foreign ministry? All of which was a very long way of saying, I don't know. Um, okay. Well, one thing we should just add, actually, about Ehud Barak and about Yalon. One of the things that uh, Netanyahu liked about Barak is that they agreed exactly on what to do about Iran. Uh, Yalon and Netanyahu don't. Um, I'm sure that he'll find someone else who does agree with him. But it, it could yet come around. I wouldn't be that so, surprised. So let's, let's just add two little things. They had a falling out about Iran towards the end there, which may have had a real impact on, on Barack's capacity to continue as a politician and his inability to sort of absorb himself in the Likud and so on. And on the, uh, on, on, you see, I think given what we're facing with Iran, 
the, the imperative to put somebody with real security credentials in the defense ministry is, is profound. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there are that many it's obvious Yaakov choices. Yaakov Perry or Yaakov. Well, but Yaakov Perry is very problematic on the Palestinian front. But you know, what, we're, what you're hearing here is you know, we, we wait to see with some interest. Yes. I think. Yeah. This is what Israelis do in the coffee shop. All, all the time, debate, actually, They all the just time. debate who's going to... We don't do anything else. Who's going to be in what <laughs> position or another. <laughs> Last question. Conrad Nadel, Scotch Plains, New Jersey. The world seems to be focused on Israeli settlements. What do the Israeli people feel about settlements? What, what's the uh, overall uh, consensus on settlements? So if we take Israel since the Six Day War, we can say that between 1967 and the First Intifada in 1987, Israelis were divided ideologically. And that is, there are a large body of Israelis who believe that because it is the land of Israel, there should be settlements. And there are a large body of Israelis who believe that for the sake of peace, they were willing to exchange that. That ideological argument almost disappeared from mainstream Israel after that. The amount of Israelis who ideologically support settlements is small. It's small, but powerful as an interest group. What's happened since 2000 is the camp that believed in peace has shrunk enormously. Now, as most Israelis believe something along the following lines. In principle, we are willing to make very great concessions for peace and security, including dismantling most of the settler settlements, but, not, but still including most of the settlers inside the borders of Israel. But we do not believe that even if we were to make those concessions, or even further concessions, that we would actually achieve peace and security, and therefore, for the time being, we are against those kind of concessions. That is more or less what the big middle of Israeli politics believes. There are still people on the left and right ideologically, but whereas that left and right was big in the 1980s and still re resonated in the 90s, it no longer does. Israelis ask practical questions. I, I would add a few things, and I'm, I'm even slightly disagreeing with you, which is so encouraging and good, because it's really terrible the degree to which we agree. Um, I'm not sure it's, you know, I think there's still quite a sizable ideologically driven um, settlement uh, community that, you know, I think most people who voted, or a lot of people who voted for Jewish Home, and certainly um, I think the Likud number is, is a bit misleading, because as, as, as Jonathan has said in the past, the Likud list was chosen by a party membership that has a disproportionate component of, of strong pro-settlement advocates in it. But I still think there's quite a sizable ideologically driven uh, pro-settlement um, wing in Israel. Um, I also think you know, there is no consensus in Israel on settlements in that it depends on the settlement. So for example, Gaza, we dismantled the whole settlement enterprise in Gaza, with, with, not without some internal trauma, to put it mildly, and yet that was the most geographically remote mm -hmm. and ideologically remote. You know, the, the Jewish sense of connection to Gaza is relatively negligible, certainly when you compare it to Hebron and Shiloh and, and uh, Bethlehem and so on. And therefore, you know, that was pretty wrenching, and the, uh, a major concession in the West Bank, I think, would be drastically more wrenching. And people's attachment is a function of, you know, is this, is this an isolated settlement in the middle of nowhere? Well, that's further from the Israeli consensus. Is this a major settlement block protecting Jerusalem from the south that was purchased by private Jewish buyers before the foundation of the state, as in the Etzion block? Well, much closer to a, to a, to a, to a more a consensual position among Israelis, but everything, it's nuanced and complicated. And I would add one more thing, because I think, you know, I certainly come from the, 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 the confused middle ground and strongly uh, Zionistic uh, um, consensus in Israel that feels we are immensely more sinned against than sinning, and that we would love to partner the Palestinians towards state, and I think most Israelis feel, you know, w w our caveats are the, 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 the state of Palestine not come at the expense of the state of Israel. It really is as simple as that, militarily or demographically. But I think, I, d I don't think you can completely marginalize the settlement issue, and I think one of the questions that we increasingly need to ask ourselves in an Israel where a, a lot of modern Orthodox Israelis are extremely pro-settlement, and where a lot of modern Orthodox um, Israelis are reaching increasingly important positions in the army, in the context of what happened in Gaza, you know, as the years go by, you, we need to wonder about Israel's capacity to um, carry out dramatic territorial compromise. 
Now, I'm giving you a very complicated and nuanced answer, but I think it's important. And, and I want to complete the answer by saying, broadly speaking, I think, I think everything that Jonathan said is right. And broadly speaking, in a context where Israelis believe that dramatic territorial compromise will give us real peace, I think mainstream Israel will overwhelm um, relatively marginal opposition. If this is you know, the, the golden deal that we're about to sign, and it means we've got peace with the Palestinians and the rest of the region, and we finally achieve normalization, I think there's almost no limit to the compromises that middle ground mainstream Israel would insist upon. But in a climate that's much more complicated, as in the real world, as far as we can predict it, <laughs> right, where there are few guarantees and where a peace treaty with the Palestinians is always going to be controversial and where it's not necessarily going to yield dramatic regional guarantees and so on. I mean, how can you even use those words in today's Middle East? It's, it's very hard to see Israel mustering the internal strength for contentious territorial uh, concessions, for uh, real challenges to the settlement enterprise. I put that out there because I think the issue is so complicated and so nuanced, and, and the, consensus, the consens consensual positions that Jonathan correctly pointed out, nonetheless, you have to, to, to look at them within that wider context. Yeah. On, on that last point, I should say that um, when I'm in Israel, I'm the head of something called the Argov Center for Israel and the Jewish People. Um, we will have a publication coming out which does research uh, among the settlers and among religious Zionists in Israel throughout and looks at what would happen in certain scenarios. Um, one of the things I'll just pick out here and to say is it depends how big the majority in Israel is in favor of it. The larger the Jewish majority, the more easy it will be for the settlers because it's a Jewish country, because they're, they're very patriotic, to reconcile themselves ultimately. But while the majority would be willing to do so, the minority that's radical has become more radical. And in that sense, it will become, could be, could be more, more, more difficult. Um, I'll just pick out that one thing. I hope that the publication will be up in Hebrew and English um, within a month or two. Thank you. Thank well, you. on that, on that non-contentious issue, <laughs> I want to thank David and Jonathan and Deborah. And all of you for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.